is the 40th installment of the series, and we're continuing with the best of the rest with a whole big batch of RPGs and strategy games. Ultima, the False Prophet, is a more or less straight port of the PC RPG, but with some stuff cleaned up from the game to meet with Nintendo's content standards, but also without a lot of quality of life improvements for people who aren't used to PC RPGs of this period, so expect to have to take a lot of notes while playing this game. The game itself plays okay. Well, the inventory management here is about as tedious as inventory management on the PC version, one of the few quality of life, life tweaks we have in this game is the fact that you're using a controller with a menu interface, which means a lot of the more pixel bitchy shuffling stuff around using the mouse elements from the DOS version of Ultima are completely out of the picture here. But this makes the game something of a watch. We have better controls here, but more compromised content compared to the DOS version. The good news is, the DOS version is on GOG, and I will have a link to that in the show notes. Not an affiliate link, though, I'm sadly on the list for that, but a link nonetheless. Dungeon Master, unlike some of the other RPGs I've gotten into thus far, doesn't work as well on the console as it does for the, on the PC, specifically for interface reasons. This is because Dungeon Master, unlike most other dungeon crawlers on consoles at this point, is played in real time. In the home computer version of the game, the player would use the keyboard to navigate the dungeon and a mouse to the interface. This allows the player to rapidly navigate the interface and quickly react to opponents in dungeons from quickly casting spells by clicking on the relevant symbols to cast that spell to attacking by clicking on the relevant attack icons. This doesn't work that well with the controller, or just a controller, I should say. The game does support the any uh, Super Nintendo mouse, and I consider that the optimal way to play this game but if you don't have a Super Nintendo mouse, this kind of puts you out of luck. As with several titles of the last episode of the show, the game I'm talking about here next is The Journey Home, and it did not come out in the United States. We had a advertised version, certainly promoted in Nintendo Power, but it never actually was released. Now, there is a translation patch of the game that is out, and so you can play it in English if you pick up a, a Super Famicom version and play it on a Retron 5 or something similar. But sadly, we have not gotten the prototype ROM dump, so we don't know what the official localization was going to look like. Now, if you, and by you I mean anyone watching the show, have a copy of a prototype translated version, please get in touch with the Video Game History Foundation so this can be preserved. The link is in the show notes. Anyway, the journey home is a lot like Ease, but with a side of Secret of Mana. It's an action RPG with hit points and leveling up, but with some puzzle-based mechanics related to conversing the game to environments. It's also a very linear game, with the game being broken up into stages like conventional action games, but you still get XP for killing things, so you can theoretically park yourself somewhere in grind. You probably don't need to, though, as by all accounts the game is pretty short, with some uh, people saying that in a non-speedrun playthrough, they were able to clear the game in under four hours. Luffy and the Fortress of Doom is a game which I've played before, and I've reviewed at Cartoon Gaming 101. I will put a link to my review in the show notes, but here's a brief synopsis of my thoughts on the game in general. I've gone back to it and revisited it for a bit. Luffy and the Fortress of Doom is vastly inferior to later titles of the series, and I'd almost describe it as a poor man's final fantasy before. Like Final Fantasy IV, the character progression is fairly linear, without any of the customization that would come in various other stripes of the later titles in the series, through weapon customization or various other things. It's also fairly grindy, with a few options to customize your character by picking up a limited number of consumable items that boost your character's stats. Additionally, the plot is, for a large portion of it, a series of nested quests quests to let you proceed with the story, and for a chunk of these, it feels more like spinning its wheels, pad out the game, than giving an actual real sense of progression to the story, which is something that Final Fantasy IV pulled off very well. Ultimately, I would say the Luffy series does not come into its own until the second title of the series, but when it does, holy cow, does it make for a really impressive game. Coming into Wizardry 5, you may find yourself asking the question, what happened to Wizardry 3 and 4? Wizardry 1 and 2 got a U.S. release on, this, on the NES, but we didn't hear about the other two games. Well, good news. 
Wizardry 3 did come out on the Famicom in Japan, and I believe it does have English language text and cartridge, and if it doesn't, there are translation patches that you can use to play the game in an emulator or an emulation place in a clone console like the Retron 5. Now, Wizardry 4 is something of an odd duck, with the player controlling the bad guy of the first game, the Wizard Wordna, as he assembles an army of monsters and seeks to climb out of the dungeon. Due to the difficulty of the game and the dramatic gameplay shift where instead of leveling up you are building a party of monsters and as some monsters die you get newer, stronger monsters to replace them, you hope. Um, it, that game didn't get a console release anywhere. Not in the US, not in Japan. There's the PC version, which I believe is available for play on the Internet Archive, but that's pretty much it. Now, as far as Wizardry 5 goes, well, it's Wizardry. It plays pretty much the same way as all the other Wizardry games do. It's a first-person dungeon crawler, you assemble a party to go into the dungeon, everything is turn-based instead of, like, Dungeon Master, where it would be real-time, that sort of thing. This lets you take your time navigating the dungeon, and in turn letting you do it right when it comes to mapping, and you will need to do some mapping. Like, when you pick the game up, when the delivery notification comes on your phone and when you're coming home from the used game store when you pick up your copy, I recommend you swing by an office depot or a grocery store or something and swing by the office supply section or school supply section and pick up some quarter inch graph paper because you're going to need it. Consequently, it bears mentioning that this game is not the most approachable RPG game out there. Out there. Most of Wizardry games have a very steep learning curve and require caution and patience, and this is no exception. That's why, if I'm going to do an LP of this, I'm not going to let's play. I'm not going to stream this let's play. It's going to be a forum one with text posts and that sort of thing because, honestly, this is just too slow paced to be enjoyable to watch in video form since a large portion of the game are retreading the same areas of the dungeon in order to grind. In a way, this actually makes the game the ultimate podcast or audiobook game. It's not as dependent on audio cues as other dungeon crawlers, it's really laid back in terms of what you're actively doing so you can take your time when it comes to mapping the game and if you want to stop and focus on a particular part of the podcast or if you have on your computer or tablet or whatever Netflix going, you can turn to focus your attention to that without running into issues. Utopia is a strategy game that uses a common camera angle and interface with populous but gameplay mechanics similar to Sierra Online's Outpost, where you have to build a base on an alien planet and only help it thrive, but make sure it's protected from enemy attacks. Because the game lets you get more hands-on and more granular with what's built and where, it actually feels a lot easier to get into and get started with in a more abstract game like Populous. With Populous, there is the sense that you have to get people you can't control to do a thing, but you can't just tell them to do the thing. Here, you are telling people to do the thing. It's a lot like SimCity, where you're, you're zoning property or sending building instructions and that sort of thing. There's a clear sense of you're telling people what to do and they do it. And that actually makes it more approachable, I think, and easier to get into, even though it uses a similar camera perspective and setup to Populous. Pacific Theaters of Operations is, for some goddamn reason, a World War II strategy game which doesn't seem to let you engage in World War II naval strategy. For example, in the course of playing the game, I had the Inter Enterprise run into fighters attacking from several Japanese carriers, and at no point it launched fighters to intercept. I don't know if the AI controlling the carrier just decided to launch a full deck load strike without giving me a chance to command the order, or if the game doesn't provide, believe in having air cover for your ships. It's just really, really stupid. I don't know if there's a option in the manual that I didn't set up or a button I didn't press, but I didn't feel like I could adequately command the fleet that I was commanding the way that I wanted to, in a way that would let me succeed in the game. I mean, presumably if I had a copy of the full manual to sit down and read over the course of an afternoon, this would be much of an if issue, but I don't have that option. Nor does the Super Nintendo version have a particularly good FAQ. The Genesis version does, and that's the version I have a physical copy of, but that doesn't help me here for this show. So keep that under consideration before you buy the game. 
We wrap, we wrap up this episode with another Koei strategy game with Romance of the Three Kingdoms 3. And this is, frankly, a slow burn, grand scale strategy game like the other three titles in the series to date. This creates a few issues when it comes to reviewing it. It's harder to just show footage of the game over the course of the show here. It's also definitely a game that requires a lot of patience from people playing it. Like, this game is a slower burn than something like Civilization or the Total War games, where you're moving lots of troops around and putting units together fairly quickly in Total War, and in Civilization there is still a degree of um, exploration and research that gives you that sense of accomplishment there. I'd put this at a level of strike complexity above Total War, but below Paradox Interactive's titles, though that's for a large part due to the nature of the interface, and that this is a game that has to be playable using a controller. However, on top of that, it does bear mentioning that the interface is somewhat obtuse due to lots of menu headings being labeled with contractions instead of full words, partly for the sake of legibility on a large CRT TV screen, and partially because the amount of space available in the interface because of the length of the Japanese versions of those menu items, where it was a couple kanji or so in the Japanese version, but here you only have enough space for like four letters before you have to start thinking about redrawing the menu. This all makes for a game that really should be played with a fact or a manual open at all times, so you know what the hell you're doing, until you've got a good grasp of how the game is played. So, while I love strategy games, I can also say with a reasonable degree of certainty that I can't give this a full-throated recommendation. Now, if what I said about the game's complexity and interface and that sort of stuff doesn't scare you off, maybe give this a thought for something to add to your collection as a game to play. As far as my pick of this episode goes, I'm a big fan of dungeon crawlers. Wizardry 5 is as big a dungeon crawler as they come, and in a more viable for playing with the controller fashion than, say, well, Dungeon Keep, um, Dungeon Master is. I mean, Dungeon Master is fun, but I'd rather play it with a mouse. If you've got any, if you've got a Super Nintendo mouse, either a original or one of Hyperkin's reproduction um, new model uh, Super Nintendo mice. That'll work too. But otherwise, I'd say stick with Wizardry 5. Next month, we're almost done wrapping up as we take on a slew of movie licensed games, which means we've probably got some deep hurting in store. So you've got, so you got that to look forward to. Me? Uh, we'll see. for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.